It's nearly impossible to make an accurate list of the most prominent ethnic groups taken in the Atlantic slave trade. The one thing we can measure for the most part are the general regions enslaved Africans were taken from and even the cultural and linguistic dominance of these groups upon arrival. What up African world, it's your boy Home Team here and I'm back at it with another video of African history, culture, and worldview. And remember, if you want access to sources, courses, exclusive videos, or you simply want to support the home team, you can do so on Patreon.com. The link is in the description box below. The Atlantic slave trade was the most tragic event in human history because of how it displaced millions of Africans from their homes and began a legacy of oppression for their descendants, generations to come. And this human tragedy is not even taken into account the Arab slave trade of African men and women which is seldom discussed. Popular culture at times assumes we can't know which ethnic groups were taken in slavery, but with a little digging, we can identify, highlight, and remember the people who experienced this tragedy. One way we can honor these Africans is by speaking their names and acknowledging their history and experience. So let's begin with the top 10 African ethnic groups taken in the Atlantic slave trade. At number 10, we have the Shamba people, the Shamba are located largely in northern Nigeria and Cameroon. They're an interesting group of people because their oral history seems to suggest that Shamba identity largely formed due to a mixture of two people who spoke different but similar languages. The Dhaka and local speakers migrated and intermingled with each other, forming a strong Shamba identity. They were victims of incessant slave raiding by the Fulani Jihads in the 18th and 19th centuries. It seemed to have gotten so bad that they migrated to the mountains, organized themselves, and retaliated, attacking slave and trading caravans. For number 9, we have the Wolof. The Wolof are located in Senegal, Gambia, and Mauritania. The origins of the Wolof are debated, but a general belief is that the Wolof originated further north and began a migration southward into Mauritania and Senegal. The Wolof founded their own kingdoms and even an empire but warring led to the enslavement of many Wolof populations. A segment of Wolof society contend that their first kingdom and founding father came from the Almoravid Empire and traveled south, bringing Islam to Senegal. Most Wolofs today are Muslims, but violent jihads in the past led to the enslavement and displacement of Wolof society. This violence was so prominent that it led to internal disagreements among the Wolof on Islam. At number 8, we have the Abran people. The Abran inhabit the borderlands of Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, and Burkina Faso. They are part of a larger Akan cultural and linguistic ethnic group. The Akan people themselves are believed to have migrated to the forested regions from a more northeastern region of the Sahel. The Abran have a matrilineal system of descent like all Akan speaking groups. They were essentially in the center of the Gold Coast slaving populace, and many were caught up in it. Because such a large number were taken, they were given a specific name in Jamaica, known as Coromantes. Coming in at number 7, we have the Fulani. The Fulani are one of the largest, if not the largest, ethnic group in West Africa. They take this title because they are dispersed amongst so many nations in West Africa and are even present in Eastern Africa. They can be found from Senegal all the way to the Central African Republic. The regions that they are most concentrated in is Senegal, Guinea, Mali, Niger, Nigeria, and Cameroon, and that's just the concentrated regions in which they are present. The origins of the Fulani are very hotly debated, but the most sound evidence points to their origin in North Africa. They are probably one of the original people in North Africa, due to some of the wall paintings that some scholars say point to their presence going all the way back to 6000 BC in Algeria. In fact, their history is very rich and full. They were well known throughout every region they inhabited and mixed with other ethnic groups. They had vast empires and kingdoms all throughout West Africa. Fulanis converted to Islam very early in their history and were the primary slave raiders in West Africa. The Fulani sold so many African ethnic groups throughout their history due to the jihads and slave raiding missions they initiated. Ironically, even though they were one of the primary slave raiders, 
they themselves were constantly enslaved. In fact, some of the most popular slaves taken to the New World were Fulani, like Ayuba Diallo, Omar Abin Said, and Abdul Rahman, all of which were taken to America specifically. Because they're one of the biggest, if not the biggest ethnic group in West Africa, it only makes sense that they got caught up in all the Atlantic slave trade mess. In fact, I myself am a product of this, as my maternal ancestry according to DNA analysis is Fulani. For number six, we have the Mande. Now some of you may think it isn't fair to pick the Mande because the Mande are a collection of ethnic groups all over West Africa that speak the Mande languages. But it's nearly impossible to pick one Mande speaking group out of all of them because there's so many and they're dispersed throughout so many countries in West Africa. The most dominant Mande group probably has to go to the Malinke, also known as a Mandinka. I guess we'll focus on them because the Mandinka built the greatest and one of the largest empires in West Africa. They influenced other ethnic groups culturally and linguistically and they raided the coastline of West Africa, intermixing with coastline people. Even some Fulani themselves have Mandinka ancestry. The Mandinka were so prominent and popular that the term Mandingo, which is an English corruption of the word, became a popular reference for strong black men with many attributes. The origins of the Mande are said to be in the Sahara, further north. Archaeological evidence suggests that the Mande groups were the first producers of stone settlement civilizations in West Africa, where they built elaborate fortified structures in Mauritania. Mande culture was the most dominant in West Africa from around 1100 BC all the way to 1600. The Mandinka raided the coastline of West Africa creating many hybrid kingdoms, all of which got caught up in the Atlantic slave trade. Coming in at number five, we have the Fon people. The Fon people are the largest ethnic group in Benin, found particularly in its southern region. They are also found in southwest Nigeria and Togo. The Fon people historically were a sort of hybrid ethnic group. Oral history of the Fon people speak on the intermarrying between the Aja and the Yoruba, creating a new ethnic group called the Fon. The Fon people created a very popular kingdom in the 17th century called Daomi, as they were well known for their female warriors, later called the Daomi Amazons. In fact, Black Panther's Dora Milaje were inspired by the Fon female warriors. The Fon people were both victims and also victimized by other ethnic groups in the Atlantic slave trade. They became a significant populace amongst the enslaved peoples of Haiti and Trinidad. The popular Haitian voodoo is a direct descendant from the Fon people. It became the catalyst used to win the war against the French in their successful war campaign to gain their freedom. Coming in at number four, we have the Bakongo. The Bakongo people are a Bantu people living along the Atlantic coast of Central Africa. They live primarily in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Republic of Congo, and Angola. Similar to the Mandinka in Upper West Africa, they created one of the most prominent empires in their region of Central Africa, called the Congo Empire. The Bakongo migrated closer to the coast around the 13th century from the Northeast and became one of the first Africans below the Sahara to convert to Christianity via trade with the Portuguese. The Bakongo got wrapped up in the Atlantic slave trade, largely due to Portuguese intrusion. The Portuguese were literally taking citizens of the Congo Empire and enslaving them illegally. It got so bad that the King of Congo wrote a letter to the Portuguese King. Each day the traders are kidnapping our people, children of this country, sons of our nobles and vassals, even people of our own family. This corruption and depravity are so widespread that our land is entirely depopulated. We need in this kingdom only priests and school teachers, and no merchandise, unless it is wine and flour for mass. It is our wish that this kingdom not be a place for the trade or transport of slaves. Many of our subjects eagerly lust after Portuguese merchandise that your subjects have brought into our domains. To satisfy this inordinate appetite, they seize many of our black free subjects. They sell them 
after having taken these prisoners secretly or at night. As soon as the captives are in the hands of white men, they are branded with a red hot iron. In fact, the grandson of the King of Congo was taken into slavery. His name was Ganga Zumba, which translates into Great Lord. His mother, the Princess of Congo, led a battalion in the Battle of Mbwila, but the Portuguese aligned with the African enemies of Congo, which included the notorious Mbangala, who were pretty much the Zulu of the region, and other African forces joined the fighting, numbering in the thousands. Due to the defeat at Mbwila, her son was taken to Brazil as a slave. But Ganga, knowing who he was, refused to be a slave. He became the first leader of a massive runaway slave settlement in Brazil. Some even referenced it as a kingdom because it had a palace, guards, and ministers. Brazil, like much of South America, became a port of entry for many Bacongo people and was one of the main entry ports for most enslaved Africans in general. Many people don't know that most enslaved Africans went to South America and not the North. Breaking our top three, we have the Igbo. The Igbo are an ethnic group native to present-day South Central and Southeastern Nigeria. The Igbo are one of the largest ethnic groups in Africa. Even though the origins of the Igbo are debated, they have a strong presence in Nigeria for thousands of years. The Igbo got caught up in the Atlantic slave trade due to the Aro Confederacy. The Aro people had migrated to the region of Igbo land as a result of the demand for slaves and palm oil. The Aro Confederacy captured and enslaved Igbos and sold them to Europeans. Many of the slaves taken from the Bight of Biafra would have been Igbo. The slaves taken from the Bight of Biafra accounted for about 13% of all the slaves taken to the Americas. Coming in at number two, we have the Yoruba. The Yoruba are an ethnic group of southwestern and north central Nigeria, as well as southern and central Benin. The Yoruba like the Fulani, are actually one of the largest ethnic groups in Africa. In North America, they might even be one of the most recognizable group of Africans. The face of an African immigrant, if you will. The Yoruba were the dominant cultural force in southern Nigeria as far back as the 11th century. The origin of the Yoruba can be placed before the Oyo Empire around El Eife. The Oyo Empire was active in the Atlantic slave trade as Yorubas became victims and victimizers in the process of enslavement. The Yoruba were dispersed in mass to multiple locations in North and South America, with enslaved populations going to Cuba, Dominican Republic, Venezuela, St. Lucia, Jamaica, Brazil, Grenada, Trinidad and Tobago, and many others. The Yoruba seemed to impact the culture wherever they landed. Yoruba culture became so prominent and dominant that the Yoruba pantheon began to be worshipped in North and South America. The Orishas today are still worshipped and celebrated. And coming in at number one, we have the Mbundu. The Mbundu people are primarily centered in Angola today. There are multiple stories surrounding the origins of the Mbundu, but the most complete one seems to point to the fact that they descend from a people group that had multiple chiefdoms around the Zambezi River. According to the Atlas of the Atlantic Slave Trade, most enslaved Africans came from the region of Congo and Angola. These Africans were largely taken to Brazil, especially from Angola. The Mbundu had many kingdoms that were vassal states to the larger Congo Empire. Queen Nzinga was the most popular Mbundu queen from that region and had extensive interaction with the Portuguese. Because of the demand for slaves were so high, the Congo Empire established slave raiding and perpetuated warfare with Mbundu kingdoms, enslaving many Mbundu people. The Portuguese themselves would align with the Mbangala to enslave many Mbundu people. The presence of the Mbundu was so high in Brazil that they began to influence the culture itself. Most Mbundu slaves were war captives, so they developed their own martial art technique and brought it to Brazil. This Mbundu martial art was called Ngolo, and in Brazil, it later became known as Capoeira. Capoeira is one of Brazil's biggest cultural indicators and a symbol of strong Mbundu presence in Brazil. Evidence of the mass amounts of Mbundu people 
taken in the slave trade is my own paternal ancestry, according to DNA analysis, which is Mbundu. I'm glad that I can have somewhat of an idea of what happened to my Mbundu ancestor who survived his journey, making me a product of survival. Well, I'm all out, guys. If you like this video and would like to see more, you can support the home team on Patreon.com. The link is in the description box below. Know thyself. Remember your ancestors. Peace. Hey, hey.